Okay, today we're going to talk about vision and handwriting. If you've seen one of my previous webinars, you probably are already familiar with some of the concepts we're going to go over um, in the beginning, so just bear with me and I'll get to the parts of the lecture that directly deal with handwriting um, in a little bit. Um, so the first question um, I always like to ask at the beginning of my webinars, um, or go over at least, is what does good vision really entail? And we'll talk about what a lot of people think good vision means and what it, um, it may actually mean um, in, in just a few minutes. Um, the other questions that we're going to talk about today are, um, well, what visual skills are needed for um, writing and handwriting? And then we're going to also talk about how vision uh, guide, helps guide the motor system. The first question, like I said, that we would like to answer is, what does it mean to have good vision? So when we talk about um, good vision, oftentimes we talk about 2020 vision. So it's important to understand what that is and what that isn't. So 2020 means that at a certain distance, 20 feet, you're able to see a certain size letter. 20 seconds of arc is what they what that. Uh, has to do with the angle or the size of the letter. So when you get down on a chart like this, down at this red line, this is the 2020 line. This big E up here is usually like the 2400 uh, or 2200 letter, so it's a much bigger. So if the number on the bottom is bigger, that means that at 20 feet, you'd be able to see this big size letter if you were, had 2200 vision, um, whereas most people can see this size. Uh, the 2020. Uh, first thing to notice about this is that we're talking about a distance measurement, although it can be uh, somewhat converted into a near measurement as well. Um, there's some, uh, this, this is really important, you know, it's important to have clear eyesight, especially if you're going to take notes off the board. But the, the thing about uh, this type of visual problem that affects the 2020 vision is that it often um, overlooks, or just focusing on this, you overlook other areas that can affect learning. In fact, most people who have trouble at distance, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have trouble at near, and that's where we know a lot of learning occurs is up close, and certainly handwriting. So if we talk about what 2020 is, when we talk about good vision, um, it's important to know that there's some other visual um, skills that are important for reading and writing. Uh, and those are what we're going to go over first today. So we're going to talk a little bit about tracking, focusing, or the medical term for that is accommodation, um, and eye teaming, which um, includes uh, what we call binocular vision, um, convergence, and divergence. First thing I'm going to show you is um, a video of um, a child who's having an eye tracking issue. So I'm just having him follow. Uh, the ball. This time I asked him not to move his head, just to see what he would do. He naturally wanted to move his head. You can see a little fatigue there with the eye rubbing. There, I'm just doing what we call uh, near point of convergence. I'm just bringing the ball closer, see if he can converge his eyes. Oftentimes this is the only screening done for um, an eye teaming problem, which we'll get to later, but um, doesn't necessarily mean he has great eye teaming. In fact, I happen to know that he did not. Now I've got two balls. One's gold, one's silver. It might be a little hard to see that. And I'm asking him to, I'm saying gold, silver, and asking him to look between the two, just to see again what he does. So one of the things you should um, or probably noticed about that is that this little kiddo had a lot of head movement when he was tracking and following, or when I was asking him to move between two, um, two dif the two different colored balls. So head movement um, for tracking, you know, it, it, we start out when we're young. We, this is a fine motor system, so when we're young, we need our head to be able to track because um, our eye must our eye movements aren't as accurate as they're supposed to be. As we get older, though, um, we, that should become more independent. Eye movements should become more independent of head movements. So by his age, which would be about eight, he should be able to 
do that with very minimal head movements, and he had quite a lot of head movements. So that tells me that when he's trying to read, for instance, um, he's going to have more difficulty keeping his place on the page. The other thing is, is his eyes might skip over information, so he might make some careless errors. Sometimes they have trouble lining things up, like in math. Um, a lot of times you might, you know, would do think about the um, the reading, but I've met, I've met some kids who have that type of eye movements and still can read okay, but what they do have trouble with is um, poor peripheral awareness, which really comes into play, especially when they're trying to, to do writing activities. So um, we're going to talk about that peripheral awareness in a little bit, um, but what I was kind of talking about there is tunneling. So if you think about when he was, I'll go back to this for a second, <clears throat> when he was doing the task where he just had to track and follow, he has to use his central vision to keep his eyes on the target. But we're also asking him to be aware of his peripheral vision to know where the target is going. Um, and again, when we get to the point where I asked him not to move his head here, now he has to use the peripheral, but what happens to the accuracy of the eye movements? It's really hard for him to use that central vision to maintain that. Um, I always use the analogy of, of looking through a paper towel tube. If you don't have good peripheral awareness, it's, you're going to have to move your head in order to be able to keep track and follow and keep up with the, with the ball. So tunneling is also you know, a decrease of um, visual span and, and attention. It has to do with also the volume of information the brain can be aware of at any one time. Uh, I put this picture in down here because um, you know, we're here in front of, I don't know, is that one of the seven natural wonders of the world, the, the Stonehenge here, and the little boy is on a screen. So uh, screens tend to increase tunneling um, in general, especially small screens, kind of using the central vision to block out the awareness of the peripheral vision. So I try to, one of the things if I see a child that has a lot of tunneling in is I will try to recommend that we kind of limit um, small screens. Um, some cases we have to limit them pretty much all together. Sometimes just limit them to, let's say, 15 minutes at a time. Um, because the kids just tend to, and adults to tend to get so focused on that central vision, that small screen that's very close, and they lose their awareness of that peripheral and spatial. Um, which then when you go to write will make it more difficult to um, understand and see the whole spacing on the page. Um, you might think, find things that are either run together or the spacing is not what the way that it should be as kind of seen in this example up above. Um, sometimes I get the uh, kids with the opposite problem. They are um, very distracted by the peripheral vision and basically have a really hard time looking and focusing things on up, up close. It's kind of the other side of the coin if you if you have a lot of difficulty maintaining your attention on something close, you're going to get distracted more by the periphery. Sometimes it's a matter of that so much energy goes into trying to maintain their fixation on that central um, target that they lose their kind of awareness of their side vision. Um, either one is, is not desirable because we need both to do well in reading and in handwriting. Here's another video I'm going to show you. This, this one. Um, has uh, not my patient. Cut that sound out. Um, so she's asking him to track and follow the eyes on the ball, similar to what I did before, except for now he's he's sitting. You can notice that this little boy has a little trouble, especially like right there, like right in the middle. And that has to do with some IT mean issues that he's having. So now she's going to cover an eye. So this is looking more she's tracking and focusing just with one eye at a time. Um, so this is going to bring more to the focusing system, which I'm going to talk about in a minute.
this too is an example where he's putting a lot of energy to getting his eyes to focus right on that ball. And she hasn't done, done it that long, really, you know, not even a minute's worth of work. But you could see all the visual fatigue showing up in his face and um, in his expressions. That was definitely difficult for him. So let's talk about focusing skills. So focusing skills, each eye, um, inside the eye, there's a lens. That lens is right there. Um, it's controlled by some muscles, these muscles here. When you look up close, those muscles have to do a little bit of work to move the lens in order to focus on the retina, which is this part back here. In general, um, in kids, that focusing system should be working pretty well at a kind of an adult-like level at by four months of age. And when I say adult, I mean a young adult because we know that as we get older, that focusing system does not work as well, which is why people go to reading glasses and bifocals. But that has to do with more of the lens itself hardening, not so much that the muscles stop working. Um, so the lens gets harder to move, which is why people will need to eventually go to those, like I said, the bifocals or the reading glasses. And kids, that should be easy and automatic. What happens, though, is like the kiddo we just saw, is a lot of times that's not easy automatic. It's a lot of work. When that happens, um, you can get some eye strain. You can get some eye fatigue. You can get some blurriness up close. Sometimes you can get blurriness far away. So if you're, sometimes there's a delay in relaxing that vision to see clearly far away, and you'll actually um, complain of um, blurry vision at distance, especially like in the afternoon when their eyes are a little tired. So then copying off the board becomes a big issue because um, that going back and forth is really difficult. Um, a lot of times we see not so much physical symptoms such as eye strain and headaches or, or even maybe the blurriness. A lot of times kids will just give up long before they get to this point and you'll see more attention deficit type um, behaviors or refusal to do things. Um, or um, uh, some daydreaming, so things that you know look a little bit more like an attention or a behavioral problem. Sometimes they're related to um, not being able to physically focus the eyes for the amount of time that they're required to in school or at home. A lot of times they save it up for at home, especially trying to do homework at the end of the day can be really difficult. Um, Eye teaming uh, skills can also cause a lot of fatigue in the visual system. So when I talk about eye teaming skills, we're talking about using the teaming, meaning having to work together. So you have two eyes. They have to put together one picture. Um, this is what gives us depth perception and a 3D um, picture of the world. Um, it also is important for giving us clear and single vision. Eye teaming is, uh, skills are um, all those muscles that control the eye movements or moving the eyes also control the eye teaming. So there's different muscles in the eye that when and when we look up close, they have to converge together. When they look far, they diverge or you know they look more straight. Sometimes when um, the eye will turn or go out, um, so like a, a cross eye or a wall eye or sometimes called a lazy eye sometimes. Um, that alignment issue has to do with um, a, a little bit more severe eye teaming issue than what I'm going to talk about today. Sometimes it can inter interfere with handwriting. Sometimes it can interfere with reading. Sometimes it doesn't. depends on the type of turn, how the patient compensates for it. For instance, if you have a really large eye turn like that, the two, each eye creates its own picture. The two pictures might actually be far enough apart from each other that they can maybe, they might have a little trouble if they switch between the two eyes, but if they always, one eye is always turned, they might end up like blocking out or ignoring the image. So, um, because it's so far away from the other one that it, the, the brain just kind of shuts it off, um, starts to ignore the double vision that, the, that you might get otherwise. Unlike this one, where the um, here that, that convergence movement I was talking about, for instance, when looking at a book, um, so this example shows the double vision. It's just a, it's just a little off. It's not that they can't you can't see it in their eyes, but as the eyes tire, they might get a little bit off and a little double vision or a little blurriness that um, the patient has to 
then compensate for, and that can be very fatiguing. It also can make, you know, and definitely interfere with writing as um, things will look like it's overlapped. Sometimes, again, the brain will learn to shut off an eye and they don't get the double vision, um, even with a, this close together. But it doesn't work as efficiently, and it will affect um, some of what the depth perception as well as, um, you know, what I often see is sometimes I get some great readers in my office, but sometimes when we get to the handwriting, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of compensate for this. Sometimes these eye teaming difficulties, kids will compensate with head turns or postural things, um, getting close to the page, um, um, tilting and turning. Sometimes it's hard for them because um, when you're using both eyes, a lot of times you know you, that's what helps guide your hand with um, eye hand using just in general eye hand coordination. So having the both eyes not working well together um, will interfere with how your brain is going to send signals to your hand to know where to go um, that will also affect um, handwriting and eye hand coordination in general. Um, like I said before, eye teaming um, symptoms will be similar to um, eye focusing symptoms where you could get headaches or eye strain. You get oftentimes, like I said, I get a lot of more avoidance of behaviors, behavioral problems, um, fatigue, you know, people that fall asleep when they read or read to fall asleep, one of the two, often have trouble coordinating the two eyes together. Um, sometimes you'll see a covering or a closing of one eye, turning of the head, um, frustration, not being able to do it. Um, kids are often, you know, I've, I will come around some older kids that will be able to describe things as being blurry. A lot of times they don't know that that's not how they're supposed to see. Um, so definitely can see just in general behavior problems. I, I do have, some, like I said, a certain subcategory set of kids where this doesn't really affect their reading as much as their um, writing because the writing is a more difficult task for them. Maybe they also have some a little bit of fine motor issues going on as well and it's the total load of the demand that we're asking that that is too hard for them. Um, other difference with handwriting is that you're generating the, the um, picture yourself. It's not just a matter of recall. You've, you're actually having to um, remember what that word or, or whatever it is that you're writing looks like from from memory. So it goes through a little bit different process, and I think we'll get a little bit into that a little, a little bit later. Um, so I did say I was going to talk a little bit about how that process of vision guiding the hand. So one way to think about vision is it's kind of our invisible GPS. So it tells us our motor system. Um, where to go and where things are, how far away things are from us. Um, when that uh, visual motor, when that visual system is not working well, it often interferes with our spatial perception and, and motor skills, even things like catching a ball will become more difficult. Um, here's an example, you know, talking a little bit about spacing and handwriting. So this is a patient before vision therapy and after vision therapy. Um, you can see that in the beginning things are really big. So the bigger things are, the um, less interfering the double vision is. But you can see as things also got big, you know, they got really big, but the, the spacing um, becomes more um, well, less desirable here, we'll say. Um, you start to see some slant. I often see that with eye teaming problems where there's a slant in the writing, either up or down. This particular person also was having a lot of trouble with um, accurate eye movement. So they missed, when the instructions are to copy the sentence down below, they missed all of these words. Um, because their eyes skipped, basically skipped over them. So the time looks pretty good, but um, they didn't really have very good accuracy for the task. Um, and we see that when we calculate the letters per minute, um, I think it's 29 letters per minute. Um, here's the after vision therapy. So you can see the, the line is there. They can put the letters on the line. They still might have had a little bit of fatigue, like, um, you know, they skipped a line on this sentence. Um, 
sometimes when things get too squished together, um, increasing the spacing between lines is very, it can be very helpful um, for the IT mean system. But you can see the quality of the work is a lot better. There was no skipping over of any words. Um, the time was longer, but I guess that's to be expected as, you know, they they wrote all the words that were on the page. So the letters per minute did decrease to 24 letters per minute. So still maybe some work to go to go on that, but um, one of the things, you know, it can't really 100% measure in this test is, is the frustration level. So if you notice here, I think by the end this person, you know, you can tell by maybe how big they made the period and how frustrated they might have been during this this task. Um, the the um, the pencil grip was you can see it's so dark and pressing really hard because they're working really hard. Um, here's another example of a different patient. This one kind of has the opposite problem. Rather than the spacing getting bigger, they are basically um, everything gets kind of squished together. I see that more in eyes. Oftentimes, eyes that over, tend to overconverge, whereas the other. This is someone who um, has what we call convergence and sufficiency, where the eyes don't fully converge together or coordinate together as well as they could. Um, so this one, they missed a few letters, not so bad, but it did take six minutes to do it, um, which was really low. This was a patient who was already, I think, in fifth grade um, and did not like writing, as they stated, I hate writing. Um, this is after vision therapy. So the quality, I would say you can start to see better spacing between the words. Um, but the biggest difference here is that this now took two minutes and 53 seconds. So he went from, seven, we'll just say 17 letters per minute to 59 letters per minute. So the speed of which they did it was vastly improved after vision therapy. And this um, as a person I have to know who actually had a, already had a lot of um, OT for handwriting through the school and outside the school um, that just wasn't, um, couldn't, he couldn't really use until he actually got his visual system working better. Other areas that can affect handwriting, um, in the, more in the area of what we call visual perceptual issues or or visual, um, how they process visual information. So reversals um, in writing can be due to poor directional concepts, um, such as not really understanding concepts of right and left. Um, more so, most kids, by the time they learn to write, have the concept of up and down, but not having the concept of right and left. They may have, um, like I talked before, about poor visual memory or really visual visualization skills as we'll talk about. So being able to picture in their head um, where um, or what things should look like. So um, that's something that we also work on in vision therapy to improve that system. We work on reversals usually by solidifying um, those directional concepts. We have lots of different activities that we do to help solidify um, the concepts of right and left. If you think of, uh, in most other instances besides writing um, or reading a map or getting somewhere, directional concepts don't really come into big a play. So a pen is a pen no matter which way you turn it. You don't really have to think about right and left as much. It's just when we come to um, doing tasks, well, like finding your way or, in this case, um, having to go from left to right when you're reading or writing, that direction comes into play. Um, another way that, besides just vision therapy, that can be helpful with handwriting are what we call therapeutic lenses. Therapeutic lenses are lenses that are prescribed not so much for um, eyesight um, as they are for improving how the, the visual system is functioning. Um, they can help the visual system better guide the motor system as seen through eye-hand coordination. Um, sometimes it can improve improve the, is to improve the focusing and eye teaming skills, um, and then hence the eye tracking skills. Um, vision therapy is more um, involved. Uh, usually vision therapy can be anywhere from a five-month to a nine-month program, depending on um, 
the patient and their, their level of visual abilities when they first start. Sometimes um, um, it can be more than that. Oftentimes we'll have patients coming weekly, working 50 minutes, um, so about an hour um, a week in the office, and then we have home activities where they'll do another um, probably 15 minutes a day in general uh, to work on individual visual individual uh, visual skills um, at home. It takes, you know, some reinforcement. I always use the riding the bike analogy. It's got to get to the point where it's just like riding the bike, so the body and the muscles of the eye and everything just does it, and you don't have to think about it. Um, in addition to, to, you know, solving the crux of the problems, I'd like to leave you with a few ideas ideas about how you might change the environment a little bit to help someone that you suspect might have a um, vision problem that's interfering with handwriting. So if you're my age or maybe a little younger or a little older, you'll remember that um, our desk used to be slanted. There used to be a slant to them. Um, that slant was about a 20 degree slant angle, and the reason for that is that a lot of studies were done that showed that having things um, flat on a desk are, is not very good from a visual stand or ergonomic standpoint. So um, so having the um, material up a little bit can be really helpful. This is one of the slant boards that we sell in the office. Um, there are other ones available. I like this one because um, it's fairly easy to write on. It's also a dry erase board, so that's something else that we um, recommend and you can use. Um, is to make things a little bit easier. I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, the um, other ways that you can help yourself is by, um, you know, it'd be nice if we taught this really early on about where to, how to hold the paper. Uh, so if you're, this is showing the posture for right-handers, so you should be tilting the paper a little bit to the left, about a 45 degree angle. And if you're a right-hander, now everything should be opposite for a left-hander. Nobody ever goes over that, I think, with my the lefties. And it's hard to change once they've decided to get this. Um, sometimes you'll get some really awkward pencil grips with a left-hander. Um, one of the things that this allows is that it allows you to see where you're going next and where you've been. Whereas if you're doing, I call it like the claw grip for a left-hander, you're going to not be able to see where you're going because your hand's going to be covering it. It's also help, um, important to use what we call the helper hand. So that's the hand you're not writing with to hold on the paper. Um, here's an example why we don't want to, um, one, why we do want, let me, let me change that, so why we do want the material at a slant has to do with the um, what's happening to the body. So when you're leaned over a page like that, you're kind of cutting off some of your, um, puts a lot of one stress on your lower back and strain, but it also kind of cuts off your breathing. And one of the things to have good peripheral awareness is involved with breathing. Um, so uh, that can happen even with a slam board if you're in the wrong type of chair, if it's too high or too low. Um, so looking at the chair, making sure that it's, um, one, comfortable. Um, sometimes we even use a physio ball, which maybe even allows a little bit more movement in the hips, or what we call a sit disc, which is basically like a little cushion where you can, that allows for some freedom of movement um, in, in the pelvis area as well. Um, making sure that the feet can touch the floor is really important um, because um, that will help ground their body, especially if you get a kid um, that has a lot, likes to move a lot. Um, the more um, they can feel their body and where it is, the easier it is to focus their eyes. So some postural things can make a difference um, with how the visual system works. Physical activities, um, the um, You'll want to, to make sure that you balance um, your academic work with some gross motor activities. Um, anything that helps develop the gross and fine motor skills will also help improve 
um, will help improve the fine motor skills and the visual system as well. I, in general, recommend limiting screen time to two hours per day, and especially, like I said, eliminating handheld games to 15 minutes. Um, handwriting practice. So I always recommend working from gross to fine motor. So you want to do um, big, work towards small. So that's where that slam board, like I said, with the whiteboard, or you can use whiteboards to to work on practicing using more bigger muscles, working down to finer muscles. Um, you might use a vertical surface first versus a horizontal surface, or again, you could use the slam board. So sometimes writing on a chalkboard or a whiteboard, nobody uses chalkboard anymore, but using a whiteboard to trace letters on, we learn how to do things vertically before we do learn to do them horizontally. Um, so working big to litter, little and then um, and this is important, especially with younger children. Make sure you improve the familiarity with the, the let, correct letter formation first before you try to do things with pen and paper uh, or pencil and paper, which is going to provide it's going to be the finest motor for the hand, but also the um, because the pencil is so such a thin marking, not like a marker, which is big and bold. It provides the most demand on the visual system as well. Um, I also do some things on the tablet. So there's an app called um, ABC123 Writing um, for the Android tablet. I think there might be something similar, like a handwriting without tears um, for the iPad as well, um, where they're just tracing with their finger. Again, this eliminates the pencil grip issue, gets them working on the correct way to form the letters, top to, to, to bottom, right, um, and left to right. Another example from the ABC handwriting. So that's the information um, regarding um, some tips also about how to make handwriting easier. You can visit our website for more information. Um, you can always contact us by email if you have any questions as well. Uh, we also um, are on Facebook, and we will post things and update things on a weekly basis that has tips and news on vision-related topics. So thank you again, and um, please let us know if you have any questions.